Hi everyone, I'm Ben Jones. Welcome to the presentation. This is all about avoiding data pitfalls, the COVID-19 edition. We're going to be covering various pitfalls that people have been falling into as they've been trying to use uh, pandemic data to be able to understand the current highly dynamic environment. And so I'll start by sharing my screen here. And um, so I published a book back in November called Avoiding Data Pitfalls. And uh, the goal was to uh, take a look at all of the different ways in which I and, and others, students of mine, have uh, perhaps fallen into data pitfalls. These are pitfalls of different, different types. And so um, I asked myself, you know, if I go through the chapters of this book, can I look at each one of the chapters and find an example of someone in the last few weeks who has fallen into a similar pitfall? And the goal here is not to embarrass them or to disparage them in any way, shape, or form. Um, in fact, the book itself is uh, full of examples of my own uh, mistakes and blunders. And so I think that they're very common. It's very easy for us to uh, make some of the same kinds of errors when we work with data. So I wanted to talk about that as it relates to the data that we're seeing coming out right now about the coronavirus epidemic. So my name is Ben Jones. I run a business called Data Literacy, LLC. That's a business that is on a mission to help people speak the language of data. So just like with grammar, part of speaking the language well is knowing the grammatical rules not to break. And um, so a lot of the, um, the content covered in the book, Avoiding Data Pitfalls, would be examples of in the English language or you know, lang any kind of language would be a poor, poor grammar, you know, poor spelling, those sorts of things. Well, the same kind of thing exists in the data world as we seek to both understand what the data is telling us as well as communicating it to others. So my first book, Communicating Data with Tableau back in 2014, was all about that one specific tool, avoiding data pitfalls is much more tool agnostic in its uh, approach. But before I dive into this, I really need to start, and I think this is actually a pitfall that people have fallen into as well, is to remind ourselves that we're talking about data that relates to people's lives. And so um, the data includes fatalities. Those are real people with families, with friends who are in mourning right now. And so it's important to remember that and to um, pay homage to that and to be sensitive to that. Uh, sometimes we just get a spreadsheet, we start analyzing it. It seems like it's cold, hard statistics, right? And they're very, um, maybe in some ways, impersonal. But we need to remember that this is a tragedy that's playing out in real time for many people. And so, you know, I just want to start by saying, you know, my heart goes out to everyone who is affected, who has been affected by this, who will be affected by this in various ways going forward. And, um, you know, just to kind of reiterate that it's important to be able to uh, show respect to, to that as well as to do what we can to help out. Also, an important reminder is that uh, many people who are talking about COVID-19 data are not themselves experts in infectious diseases or public health. Okay? And actually, that applies to me, too. I'm not an expert in either one of those very important topics. Okay? So because of that, I'm going to limit my thoughts in this presentation to data pitfalls only. So I'm not going to be giving my opinion about the nature of the spread of viruses or how that plays out or ways to prevent it. I mean, that's not really my domain of expertise. There are others out there who are um, brilliant in this topic. And so uh, I would like to refer you to them. For example, you know, going to the CDC website, going to the World Health Organization's website, they've set up special websites for the latest information uh, that's uh, been published by researchers, by public health experts, by infectious disease experts, by medical professionals. So again, those are the people we should be uh, more than anything looking to, as well as as well as amplifying. Okay, so wanted to start with that. Uh, just a you know dose of humility here, right? Like this is not my this is not my domain. Um, one thing that is my domain is hiking and backpacking in the Pacific Northwest. So this is me up on top of uh, Mount Washington, not too far from where I live. As you can see, I'm taking a look at Mount Rainier there in the distance. And so, you know, I noticed as I was learning hiking over the past seven years or so here in the area that um, oftentimes I would come across signs like this, warning signs telling me what not to do, where not to go. And um, I thought to myself as I was going on the trails learning that, I mean, are there similar kinds of warning signs in the data world? Because in some ways, you know, it's a journey we're on. And I saw that there were lots of warning signs, mostly about bad pie charts, charts to avoid, you know, a lot of it focused on chart choice, specifically the pie chart. Uh, and though as I reflected on all the times I'd been working with data, and as I started to teach at Universal, University of Washington, working with students, noticing that you know, we were making some of the same kinds of errors, and many times it had nothing to do with chart choices, many times it had nothing to do with pie charts, 
It was about the way we were processing the data, the kind of calculations we were doing, the assumptions we were making about the data, those sorts of mistakes. And so that's why I decided to write this book. And so a graphic designer here in the Seattle area named Kelsey O'Donnell, fabulously talented uh, person that I've been lucky enough to work with, created this guy, this um, guideline, and I'll send this out, and, I'll, and it'll, it'll be in the links down there too. You can go to my website, dataliteracy.com, fill out your uh, name in there, and it'll go into your email inbox. And it's a kind of a guide that goes through each one of these seven uh, pitfalls. There's an eighth too we're not going to talk about today, but a really important one that I encourage you to buy the book and learn about. But we'll cover the, the seven in this one. So she created this guide. So again, kind of like taking a hike, right? You're going up a mountain time, mountaintop, you're on a road, you're on a path. And along the way, there are various dangers. And so I want to cover those dangers one by one as it relates to COVID-19 data. Okay, so that's what the presentation is all about. I hope you learned something from it. Feel free to add your own in the comments, share it on social, if you will. Um, again, not in the spirit of calling people out and pointing at them and laughing and, you know, whatever. I mean, it's tempting to do that. I've done that. I think also uh, instead, rather, I would say, you know, I try to say, oh, yeah, like that's that's I've seen that. I've done that. And, um, you know, instead of just kind of shaming people that, that make mistakes, um, we'll save that for people who are being deliberately manipulative. So. That's another topic for another day. But the first kind of error, these are epistemic errors. Epistemology, this is the field of, of philosophy that deals with how we think, what we know, what we believe, what the difference is between those things. And so there is a big whopper of a data pitfall that starts with the very first one in the entire book. There's 25 total in these, what turns out to be eight groups. And 1A, pitfall 1A, is called the data reality gap. Okay, and what is this about? Well, this is about the fact that we seem to forget when we work with cold, hard data, spreadsheets, databases, even sometimes simple lists. Sometimes we forget. In fact, I think often we forget that there is a gap between that data and the reality that is trying to inform us about. Sometimes it's a narrow gap. Sometimes it's a massive, wide, Grand Canyon level gulf. Okay. And so it, it's true also that that's the case with the, the confirmed case data coming out, publishing every single day now about this disease as it spreads. So I'll refer you to a fabulously talented data journalist out of London, John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times. And John has been uh, slaving away literally day after day after day, working hour upon hour, putting together these very helpful charts and graphs that help us understand the nature of the growth of these confirmed cases over time. And he's been doing this on this log chart uh, with um, the y-axis being logarithmic, as you can see in the bottom left here, the x-axis being linear. That's actually not very standard, and so some people um, are concerned about that or object to that. I think it's, he's doing an effective job of conveying the growth, uh, even though it has been at the beginning phases exponential. But one thing he changed from, as you can see, March 22nd, just a few days ago until today, is that he added a, a tiny little word that I think is very important, which is that these are about confirmed cases. Okay? Can look at your cumulative number of cases up here in the top left. Now he says cumulative number of confirmed cases. And he even calls that out in Twitter, also giving credit to Max Roser of Our World in Data for suggesting that. And um, so I think that that is a, a really important distinction, right? Because there's a variety of reasons why the confirmed case number is not anywhere near the number of actual cases, okay? Could be testing, uh, as Nate Silver points out here, that we really need to focus on uh, the fact that we're dealing with the detected reported cases, even Elon Musk agrees there. And so just an important distinction, right? There is actually, so the question is how big is that gap? Well, that's really hard to know, but there are some researchers that took a look at the first few weeks of Wuhan and they actually, it was really interesting. I read this um, uh, research paper they published just a few a week ago now. They talked about the known travel between the different provinces in that area as well as the growth in confirmed cases. And they were able to create a simulation, okay, to determine, to kind of simulate movement between the provinces as well as the spread of the disease. And did you know they estimated based on their simulation, so not like um, a measurement of the real world, essentially just taking known data, travel patterns, also known data, growth of confirmed cases, putting it into a model. That model seemed to indicate that as much as 86% of all of the infections were undocumented, okay? And that of those people who were documented, there's a 79% chance, according to their simulation, that they got it, you know, they contracted the disease from someone who was not documented. So 
that's a big gap. You know, there's a huge gap there between what's being reported and what's actually happening. This sums it up here. This I mentioned Max's uh, name earlier. I like this quote here from Max. Data on COVID-19 is not good, he says. The one battle I'm trying to fight these days is to make clear how little we know. The structure of our article is basically we want to know this, but all we know is that. And all I hope the subtitles we put make clear how limited the data is, right? So there's the humility, the concern in this um, tweet. You can just read it. You can feel it, you know, that this is something that he's struggling to try to convey uh, adequately, okay? I love this point that Ann Emery made as well. And she, um, if you just do a search right now for, you know, coronavirus chart or something like that on Google Images, you'll see some of them that aren't really clear when they were published. So for example, on the bottom right here, um, this chart uh, does have the date, but it's at the bottom in a little asterisk, small print at the bottom, okay? Whereas the one on the left uh, actually shows no date at all, okay? So when was it created? You know, I don't know. It looks like it's been pulled out of context. That happens sometimes with images. So we need to be very careful that Anne points out here, and I think she's dead right, to put the data, the date up top in large fonts, not down at the bottom, not leaving it out altogether. Put it up there. Hey, this is data from a certain date. So good point there by Anne. All right, let's move on to number two. So we covered epistemic errors. What about technical trespasses? So, you know, we're working with data that is being put together, being published every single day. Um, it's dealing with nations, it's dealing with provinces, even counties and cities. So there's some hierarchical data in there. There's confirmed cases, there's deaths, there's recovered, there's active. Okay, so different types of variables that are being in there. And, and what that is going to result in almost every time is, is dirty data. I mean, even with all the eye, eyes on this data, it's still going to have issues with it. I mean, you know, it always does. I gotta say, I mean, kudos to the people at Johns Hopkins University that have been putting this data out there on a GitHub page. Really remarkable what they've been doing. There's also a data.world site that I believe Tableau and others have um, collaborated to put together with the data that's structured in certain ways to make it easy to use with different software products like Tableau. And I noticed on the conversation thread about this data that there was, a couple days ago, a conversation, people saying, you know, hey, there's missing data in here. What happened to recovered and active cases? And then um, this individual says, you know, hey, when I woke up this morning, the 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time data set is only showing confirmed and deaths, no active, no recovered, right? And then he says he found the answer on this GitHub page. And I clicked on that link, and lo and behold, the um, people put together this GitHub page did a fabulous job of explaining what they were doing. They're making a change. To the data. So the data is uh, very dynamic every day. It's being updated, but so is the structure. So is the nature of what they're presenting and such. Okay. And then notice the effect this had, and we have to keep an eye on this, right? So people that were using automatic uh, pulls of the data into their dashboards were getting errors. And so, you know, that's really common. That happens a lot with uh, especially data when we connect live to, to sources online that other people are in control of. Okay. There's also, I mean, it's, you know, we know about uh, this kind of a joke in the data visualization world about Null Island, right? So Null Island is um, not a real place. It's, it's actually, well, I guess it's a real place. There's just no island there. It happens to be where the equator crosses the prime meridian, zero latitude, zero longitude. And it's right down here uh, below this little um, kind of area here in West, West Africa, North, Northwest Africa, okay? And you can see there's a big circle there, right? Well, there's no actual cases that are being, it looks like a rather large circle. In fact, it's bigger than any of the circles in Africa. Uh, but actually, you can see that there are 28 different data points there, including cruise ships that had no location, unassigned cases in places like New Jersey or Georgia or Massachusetts. You can just keep thumbing through this, okay? So there's many different uh, cases that are being lumped onto Null Island over here. And so, you know, is that dirty data? They're doing a fairly good job of, of, uh, mon of, of marking that and explaining what it is. Uh, but oftentimes that can be confusing for people. They might see this and assume for some reason there's a large number of cases somewhere here in the um, the South Atlantic Ocean. Not the case, just it's just Null Island. So lots of different, you know, kind of technical uh, glitches with the data. There's another one, actually, and I would uh, lump it under the mathematical miscues section, and that's because it deals more with aggregations and hierarchies within the data itself. And so oftentimes with data, we try to aggregate. In other words, we add up levels um, maybe we have a hierarchy in this case of country to region to county to city, 
and those get aggregated as you go up and the numbers get larger as you go higher up the hierarchy and then you break them down lower down. And so sometimes that can have some funky nuances to it. So let me just connect to uh, a data, the data set that was available on March 22nd. So here it is. So I noticed when I double clicked on the country region, this made a map here in Tableau, okay? And then if I created circles that were sized by the number of confirmed cases, um, at that time I noticed something kind of strange, which is that Greenland had uh, zero cases here, okay? At the time, this is back at the as of last Sunday, March 22nd, uh, I noticed on the website uh, that I just showed you this coronavirus tracker uh, that actually there were four cases at that time in, in Greenland. You can see as of today, it's grown up to six. And so I thought that there was a problem there, maybe an error with the data. And so I was a little confused by that until I realized that actually if I bring in my country region and I bring in the number of cases and take a look at them, you'll see, just like uh, we expect, the, um, the number for Greenland here is zero. So I'll scroll down, here's Greenland, it says zero. But if I break out country region by province and state, then if I scroll down to Denmark, which owns Greenland, I can see four cases there. Okay, so that's the nature of that discrepancy. Also, you know, um, there's other little funny things in here that have since been cr uh, corrected. In fact, if you take the data set today, Greenland is not in there at a country level at all. It's not in there. Also, there's some interesting changes that have been made recently too. Um, for example, you notice the Bahamas and the Gambia, okay? Uh, they're listed here. But then if I go up to these um, uh, earlier up here, I can see Gambia, the, okay? Also Bahamas, the. And there's other similar kinds of, of issues with uh, the different countries. And it's really common when we're dealing with country data that those sorts of um, kind of uh, potentially, you know, uh, mathematical mistakes can, can be made as we just do something simple like count the number of countries now knowing that that's going to give us probably a wrong answer. Cabo Verde and Cape Verde and a few others that uh, those who joined the live webinar told me all about. Okay, so there we go, right? So those are some of the examples of some of the mathematical errors. Also, another one I talk about in the book is the fact that oftentimes we are working with units, um, like, for example, you know, miles and kilometers or pounds and grams. And sometimes we get those wrong. We're maybe combining different units and not... Uh, this happened all the time. I went to engineering school at UCLA, and we always had to be really careful about making sure our units were correct. Um, it's the nature of um, the uh, error that caused a, a Mars lander to crash uh, back in the late 90s, I believe. And so we can see an example of that, too, as it deals with, uh, you know, the, the pandemic data. Here we are, the Economic Times. Let me ask you a question based on this chart you see here. So does coronavirus last longer on cardboard or on plastic? And if you look a little careful, you'll see, well, first of all, I think it's cardboard because the bar is so long. But then I realized that it's in hours, whereas in the plastic and stainless here are in days. So it's actually a three to one factor difference in favor of plastic and steel. So answer to that simple question is plastic, but maybe we would have missed that if we just took a quick glance and moved on. So we have to be aware of that as well. So uh, moving on here, the fourth of seven pitfalls to consider. So there are some statistical slip ups are going to be, you know, yeah. And one of the common ones, I think, is the fact that, you know, especially early in the outbreak, we see small samples, oftentimes countries with just a handful of cases, perhaps, and then people trying to compute things like the uh, mortality rate uh, of the disease. So, for example, on the left-hand side here, you see a bar chart published a Business Insider that shows uh, by country the different fatality rates, Italy up there close to 8%, all the way down to Norway down here at 0.21%. And they're choosing countries that only have at least a thousand cases. But uh, if you were to take a look at others and below that, even some that only have, say, a few dozen cases or less, then you would really need to, in fact, even perhaps also for the thousand cases ones like Norway down here, you'd need to start adding error bars um, like they do here. As uh, For example, you can see Bangladesh at the top having a 12.82% case fatality rate, but only based on 39 cases, right? So case fatality rate, just due to the statistics alone, because of the small sample, could be between 4 to 27. But then, so, And then also on top of that, really, is the, the fact that the denominator is highly unknown, as we talked about before. 
if it's only dealing with confirmed cases, right, that's the only thing that's going into the equation is confirmed cases. Many, many people not reporting, many people asymptomatic, many people staying at home and fighting off what feels like a very mild uh, kind of uh, case of, of cold or flu. And so those aren't being included in the, in the denominator here, right? So I guess one thing is small sample sizes. The other thing is some statistical problems with the uh, uncertainty associated with the numerator and denominator of the fatality rate. Good things to keep in mind as we look at these. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, when we're looking at this from a few years down the road, we'll have much more certainty. You know, we're in the thick of it right now, in the middle of it. Everything's highly dynamic and changing. And uh, the number of tests that are being run day in and day out are uh, wildly fluctuating. Okay. So those things have an effect on the statistics that we look at too. So easy to, to assume that there's some certainty there. Easy to also not pay attention to sample sizes and such and, and get that wrong. The next one I think is maybe the biggest one and, and the one that I'm the most concerned about. And that is that we start to do analytics on confirmed case data only. And that, especially as non-experts like myself, that is really, really dangerous territory. So forecasting is very tricky business especially as it relates to a pandemic that's growing initially at, at an exponential rate, but we don't know for how long, okay? Uh, when is it going to have that inflection point where, it's, where it starts to taper off based on herd immunity, based on different measures the country puts in place and such? So there's a temptation to download the data, start fitting you know, um, models to it and starting to say what's going to happen in two, three, four weeks. Big, big problem that there, right? So one of them that really irked me a little bit, and I, I usually try to be pretty positive and, and such on social media just because of how much negativity swirls around it. But this one got me, and I actually came a bit unhinged on this because there's a uh, blog post on um, a website called Talking Points, points with a Z, Talking Points, back in the late February, so you know early days, saying coronavirus, get over it. Okay, and this person was doing some back of the napkin forecasts about the likelihood of dying uh, if you get it and such, including making wild assumptions like, let's assume there's only a one in a thousand chance and let's assume the death rate is 1.4%. So what does that mean? You know, and I was like, wait a second, you know, where this is like literally the first couple months of a pandemic and you're starting to lock in numbers and tell people how to feel. And then it really bothered me that um, when I realized this person writing it was a highly technical HR executive in the pulp and paper industry. And it was just like, oh no, like this is not your domain. This is really a highly volatile situation where people's lives are on the risk, on the line. And then you get medical professionals like Dr. Drew, who's more or less, I think I, in this point, a talking head, um, saying truth and linking to it as if this is truth, you know, and to me, this caused, he has 2.7 million followers. This caused many people to just go, Oh, give me a break. It's not a big deal. Right. Look at Dr. Drew. He's telling me not to worry about it here. Right. So I, I was upset about this and I said so online and, and you know, I, I, I don't think we should be doing this. I think we need to be careful. Even experts like here in the university of Melbourne applying uh, purely exponential forecasts to what we know spread of disease is, is logistic, not exponential, at least in the long run. They're only applying the forecast for a 10-day period of time, so probably not too risky here, except that um, you know these are looking like highly concerning sorts of forecasts. I guess just what we don't know is how the, when, when the spread is going to change from an exponential to a logistic because that rate continues to change. Another, uh, I would call armchair epidemiologist here, um, cranking out little spreadsheets and fitting exponential curves ad infinitum. And again, you know, we know that the spread of the growth of populations does not follow that curve uh, forever. Okay. So there's exponential growth on the left-hand side that is similar in the beginning phases. And then eventually it switches to logistics as a uh, logistic growth, as you start to see resource limitations, as you start to see some of the effects of a growing population that tends to dampen the growth rate. Okay. A really great primer on this for people like me, who I would consider to be lay audience with regard to this topic is this video by three blue, one Brown on YouTube. Highly recommend you watch it. I put it up here on my big screen, have my teenage boys sitting on the couch, watching it with me. Really great explanation about why this sort of thing happens. It's actually using the COVID data to make the point. So highly recommend you watch that. I'll put the link down below. All right, so I love this blog post by a true expert in forecasting. His name is Rob Hindman. 
based out of uh, Australia. And I'll put the link down there too. Um, he talks about forecasting COVID-19 and what makes forecasting in general difficult is that we need to consider three major factors. As you see here, one, how well we understand the factors contributing to it. Okay. Two, how much data is available. And three, whether the forecasts themselves can affect the thing that we're trying to forecast. Um, and so in the case of a pandemic, those three uh, bullets all contain challenges to them, right? Um, you know, we don't necessarily know things like you know, what's causing it to spread early on. Is it airborne? Is it, you know, on surfaces? How long? Um, all those factors, okay? How much data is available? Again, you know, it's unknown about confirmed cases versus actual cases. And then when we produce these forecasts, this is what causes countries to take different uh, measures in order to stop the growth. So the forecast itself, unlike the weather, the weather doesn't care what your forecast says. Well, guess what? The spread of diseases amongst the human population, in some cases, can be highly affected by the forecast itself. And so he talks about how he's really recommending that we are very careful not to apply simple models based on the confirmed cases that we know are um, woefully you know, um, inadequate in terms of capturing the, the true total. And so highly recommend you read this blog post if you're really interested in understanding why you should be careful if you're going to create a forecast. I'm not saying don't create one. Go ahead, download the data, play with it, check it out. Be really careful if you're trying to share that with other people. I don't recommend doing that. I'm not doing that myself. He has a whole online textbook. If you really want to dive into this topic, there's an entire forecasting principles and practice textbook that Rob, as well as a colleague of his, have published and put out there for free. So again, you know, that's even uh, they are experts in the topic and they're saying it's really challenging with this scenario. Other experts who uh, are out there are forecasting and you can see some of their work like the Imperial College here in the UK, uh, taking a look at different uh, infectious disease, you know, um, outcomes based on different kinds of measures we might take, closing schools, isolating cases and such. And what that could do to what we're now knowing is this curve that we want to flatten. And so they're looking at different forecasts there. I'll switch to the live one on this one. There's a, a really amazing one that has been created. And I'll just reconnect to it. This is based on um, a team of people have, have come together to publish this, this amazing forecast here. And um, what they're doing is actually taking a look at all these different parameters as variables you can change. So a really fascinating kind of, um, kind of uh, approach here to model, you know, instead of just looking at the outcome of the data and, and plotting it, they're actually looking at the inputs to this exact scenario and trying to plot that. And it looks like it's not loading right now. I'm guessing maybe I'm having issues with my Wi-Fi. Hopefully it's not affecting the recording. But I'll put the link to this uh, forecast in the in the chat, uh, in the description below, so you can check it out yourself. Again, really interesting how you can uh, take a look at it. Now, one thing about this uh, model is that you can see that it was created by um, a uh, developer named Allison Hill at Harvard with uh, collaboration along with epidemiological oversight as well as mathematical modeling from people like Penn and Iowa State and other places. So again, for me right now, what I'm saying is I'm leaving the forecast into the experts. I think that they're um, doing the best that they can. And uh, you know, me adding my little Excel spreadsheet to the mix is not going to be good. Okay, a few more to go here. Got a couple minutes left. Um, there are lots of charts and graphs swirling uh, every single day all over social media about the out. Uh, outbreak and some of them are a little challenging to make sense of and read a lot of them use this technique called graduated symbols like this one here you can see this is a map of the United States from uh, from just a couple of days ago as I'm sitting here today on March 26 this was from two days ago you can see most of the cases up here in New York but also notice that there are really only a couple sizes here there's three in fact there's a large one for New York there's pretty much all the rest that are in this 50 to 10,000 bucket and then there's a few here like in the Dakotas, that's uh, the uh, under 50 case um, group, right? So again, the way to graduated symbols because you go up these different bins or levels. Uh, but what that means is when we have this scenario here, this you can see this one's by ABC News. It means you have a scenario here like you know Washington with 2,300 cases. That's where I live. To the south of us, you've got Oregon, 210 cases, more than factor 10 difference, same size circle. 
So I would argue this is really a better case for something I would call a proportional symbol map. And I made this using the same data with data wrapper.de uploaded the case data. And you can see now the Washington, Oregon, California sizes are more representative of the different number of cases in each of those states. Okay. Now, eventually, as time goes on, we're eventually going to see this exact map start to resemble a population map. Okay. Because as the, there are more people in New York and California and Florida and Texas than there are in some of these other states. So eventually, like this XKCD joke, it's going to just look like a population map. Okay. And so as that happens, um, what we want to do is be able to flip to a rate based. Okay. So I took the data, found the populations for each state. So again, this is all just non-expert reporting here, right? This is me with my laptop, getting the data, matching it up, doing the math. Okay, so no, not official figures by any stretch of the imagination. But, but what you can see that's different is that, you know, now we're taking a look at cases per 100,000 people, okay? And you're noticing that New York still stands out. But also now other places like Louisiana uh, pop up on the radar a little more than they did when we looked at the proportional symbols. Right. And so notice this is more of a rate, like the number of confirmed cases uh, as a function of a population. Right. So there are many cartographic experts out there who say that you should really only use a field map or a choropleth map like this with rates. And then you should only use the proportional symbols with uh, with totals. And so here's an example, Kenneth Field saying that um, you have to normalize your choropleth. He feels so strongly about it. It looks like he's proposing he's going to put it on his own gravestone. You know, my point of view, again, I'm not a cartography expert, but in terms of data visualization in general, I typically think that nothing is written in stone except for maybe something like this that was well, you know, written in stone. But, but in any case, I think that it's a good uh, rule of thumb to follow. Uh, and we're seeing lots of people, you know, not do that. But, uh, but in any case, you know, Totals as sizes, rates as colors generally is a good idea. Proportional symbol maps, as I mentioned, you know, those are helpful. But what I'm also noticing is actually some interesting graphic approaches like this one that I would call maybe disproportionate symbol maps. Take a look at the data here in Spain and look at Madrid, for example, over a thousand cases back um, on the 11th of March, right? And then here's uh, the Valencia, Valenciana community with only 65 cases and having the circle that's the exact same size. So this is really just a graphic designer putting circles around and having them fit and not really sizing them. The area has nothing to do with the number of cases. So this might be misleading. I would say don't do this. Don't give different size circles if the size of the circle is not a function of the number of cases. It kind of gives the impression that it is, you know, so it's something to watch out for. All right. Also, this one actually is from the CDC, and this was um, tweeted along with a statement saying, hey, guess what, 20-year-olds, you're just as likely to be in the hospital, right? So if you take a look at it, the light blue is hospitalizations, and you can see, okay, yeah, it's the second highest bar is this young age group. And you might look at that and say, what? I thought people that were older were the ones that are having trouble with COVID-19, okay? And actually, what's misleading about it is take a close look at the size of these bins. You've got 20 years here. 25 years here, okay? Then it's just 10, 10, 10, 10. Okay, so the size of that young, um, younger population bin is two and a half times as large as the other ones. So again, a little misleading, right? Because people are taking away from this, you know, how likely am I to have to go into the hospital based on the age group that I'm in? Something to watch out for. Um, this one I never really figured out, honestly. And it just it looks like it's showing something about the, sp uh, the contagious, the infectiousness of the disease. Right. It says that figures represent the number of people who can be infected by coming into contact with a carrier. But I mean, in theory, that's infinite. I mean, clearly it's not. I mean, there is a um, R naught, right? R zero. That's telling you how many people typically get a disease from another person. But I added up these percentages and they add up to 100 percent. So I just don't know why you would have the data like this adding up to 100 percent. I'm not quite sure what that means because you don't have a group of people. So they're using a part to whole visualization of a pie chart here or an exploded kind of wedge diagram to convey something that is probably not part to whole data. So something wrong with this one. Again, I'm still scratching my head about it. I'm not trying to make fun of them. I just, I honestly just don't know what it's saying. So something to be careful about. Last but not least, you know, I, as I mentioned, this is a very uh, serious kind of a, a scenario here where people's lives are on the line, right? And so, in the book, I talk about how you sometimes have omitted opportunities. In other words, there's a chart or a graph and there's a chance or a scenario where you can add a graphical design element to really make the graph much more memorable, 
much more um, kind of um, attracting audience and such. Okay, in a case like this, I think that we need to be very careful with those. My opinion is we need to be careful with those sorts of design decisions. Again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're talking about real people's lives. This isn't just data. This isn't just a spreadsheet with numbers in it to you know put some graphical techniques at it and um, make something pretty, you know, or scary like this one. Okay, so I, I really don't think this is very tasteful. I think what they've got is a bunch of, uh, looks like these images of the virus maybe all over the UK. And, you know, it's, it's a little sensationalistic, I guess maybe, is my point of view about this. You might disagree. You might think this is uh, just fine. Um, and sometimes it isn't just a question of the sensationalism of it. Like this is the other side of that, I believe. Also it turns out to be quite cluttered, right? So there's a design decision that was made where we put these three rows tables all over the place with lines. And it just really kind of is an overwhelming graphical experience in terms of, you know, how I actually feel about it when I look at it. Wow. That's just almost too much to take in. Okay. So something to watch out for there. All right. So I'm going to put a link in the bottom here again to a place you can go, as I mentioned at the beginning, where you can get a little checklist that goes through each one of these pitfalls uh, that we talked about today. And it's just helpful anytime you're working with data because we make these same kinds of mistakes all the time. It isn't just COVID-19 data. You know, I wrote this book before. This, uh, I talk about the Ebola epidemic in the book, but, um, but you know, we make these kinds of mistakes when we're dealing with everything from sales data in our company to our own fitness data to, you know, it's, it's just, these are very common mistakes that people make, I make, still make, you do too. So I gave a resource out there designed by uh, Kelsey O'Donnell to be able to help you kind of just in a really important case, go through and take a mental note of each of these and see if you're covering your bases. Okay. So there we go. Those are seven uh, pitfalls that I'd like to encourage you to be a little more aware of, right? When you're working with your data, I hope that was helpful to you. And if you uh, ever need to get a hold of me, there's my contact info. So B Jones at dataliteracy.com. You can find me on LinkedIn at the Ben R. Jones uh, extension. And then I'm also on Twitter all the time at data remix. So tweet this, let me know what you think about it. Um, subscribe to my channel. I'm going to keep doing more of these like it if you thought it was helpful. I wish you all the best. Be safe, flatten the curve. Let's get through this together. Let's be positive. Let's try to do our best and, and, uh, help out where you can. Okay. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye now.